you uh, three little stories to just to also just add to the things to think about about freedom. Patrick, um, the reason I sometimes tell Patrick's story is it's interesting in lots of ways, but Patrick is somebody who, when I met him, he was in a room on his own, described as the second most challenging person in the institution. Nobody came near him except as a kind of game of uh, tease and tag, which often led to incidents of challenging behaviour. So other people on the ward w would make, it just, it was a terrible, boring place to be. So what they might do is then say, let's see if we can dare to, to annoy Patrick and see what happens. That was his life, sitting on the ward with people playing with him. Um, a friend, of, a friend I was working with at the time, I, I used to go into the staff all the time and say, so how do you manage Patrick's challenging behaviour and what's the strategy? And, and if, when Patrick does this, what, and I could never get an answer. And she said, Simon, 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 don't you understand? They just jump on him. There is no, you know, but they can't say they just jump on him because they can't write that down. But that's all they do. That's why there is no policy because that's all they do in these extreme situations is they just jump on him. So that was Patrick's life as far as I could gather him. So getting him out of there was a big challenge, but we had one thing going for us, which was, despite all the things, terrible things that happened to Patrick, he still had a family that cared about him. And that family knew, uh, they knew their son. They knew their son. And um, one of the things that we did then, Patrick didn't really use very much language, was think about how to get a vision for Patrick's life. In a way, how to help Patrick be free when Patrick has no real experience to go from and very limited communication. That, in these situations, you have to listen to the dreams and aspirations of, of those who do care about Patrick, uh, or somebody like Patrick. And for Patrick, his family initially were a bit stuck, though, because I would say, well, Patrick could live anywhere, because we have this approach, which is, you're coming out of the institution, but you're a human being, you've got rights, where would you like to live? Just a very ordinary approach to housing. Um, and the, Patrick's mum and dad would say, well, I think the dad would just say, um, well, so I hear what you're saying, Simon, yeah, but um, I can't see Patrick living in a tower block in Glasgow. And I go, no, no, that's not what I said. I said, we can live anywhere. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. I see what you're saying, but I can't see Patrick living in a tower block in Glasgow. What had happened was that the image of community care, what he understood to be community care, dominated his imagination. So this issue of information, as far as he was concerned, that was the only option realistically available, and all I was coming out with was the normal professional nonsense, yes? So I said to him, right, right well, let's just imagine you had a million pounds and you just now designed somewhere for Patrick, humor me. So they describe, in the end, a four-bedroom house on the coast of Scotland, near his sister. A whole set of features because they and he have significant vision impairments. Um, all sorts of things in relation to his autism and his behaviour. Patrick's been living there since 1997. It didn't cost a million pounds, it cost £87,000. Not only that, after we agreed that that's what the kind of place we need to find, it was the family who found the house. All I did was figure out how we get the mortgage paid, yeah? And the family also set up a trust in order to own the house because Patrick's, Patrick wouldn't under law be allowed to do that. Can you see that's freedom in action? Both in the, the love and the imagination and creativity and energy and the legal re re arrangement set up. That's freedom in action. So freedom works for people <coughs> like Patrick people who don't use words, people who even do dangerous things, freedom works. But you have to do some extra work. It's not stuff you can just sit around thinking, oh well, just ask the simple question and you'll get a simple answer and you can just act on it. You've got to think. The other story I want to tell is um, Michael's story. Now, I'm embarrassed telling this story because I don't really know what the ending to this story is. And I don't do this anymore, but I did do a bit of kind of consultancy where I went in to look at a problem that was going on and, um, and try and diagnose it. But it was a very moving situation and so I'm going to tell it and I think it does have some useful lessons in it. Um, so I was contacted because Michael, living in a group home, um, 
I think they'd probably call that supported living, but it was a living in a group home where Michael had been, they called the police on him several times, he'd been dragged off to the police station for challenging behaviour. What I discovered was um, the trigger for this problem was relatively straightforward, which is that when Michael came, was at home, sometimes there'd be something like the ice cream van would come up. Michael would like an ice cream. He'd like to go and get an ice cream, but the staff would say, you can't get an ice cream because uh, there's, there's, only, there's two staff on and there's three of us in the group home. We can't leave you. We can't leave you to go out. And anyway, you might not be safe. Yeah? So far, you, I don't know, you might think that's reasonable or unreasonable. We dig a bit deeper. Michael was going to a day centre about two miles away in Glasgow. He would go to the day centre every day, but by the middle of the day, he was bored, and he would come home. He would come home by walking two miles across Glasgow back to his home. Yeah? But because he's under his own steam, and he's not under the care of the group home staff, nobody seems to be so worried about that he might suddenly, I don't know, attack kids in the street or go wild with his ice cream cone, whatever it is that they're slightly fearful of. So completely inconsistent, and completely inconsistent for Michael, and completely unreasonable, of course, but unreasonable and consistent is particularly maddening. What was even more moving was I went to see Michael's mum, and Michael's mum had Michael back every two weeks um, for a long weekend. And uh, she, she said to me in a whisper, she said, now don't tell social services because I might get in trouble. Uh, she said, but when Michael comes over on a Friday night, I set up a kind of uh, arrangement where I set him a task, and every time he comes, I make the task a little bit more complicated. So he goes and visits a friend, and then he goes to the shops and buys something. And... So the only person in Michael's life who's thinking about how to strengthen his independence is his mum, who he sees every two weeks. The only one behaving like a social worker is his mum. And she's frightened to tell social services in case she gets in trouble. And meanwhile, Michael's going back to a residential care home where people are behaving in a way that is causing challenging behaviour and they can't see their part of the problem. They see Michael as the problem. They see no problem in calling the police on somebody they're there to support. That's how severely bad badly these things can get, I think, if we're not thoughtful about what we're doing. Last one. Now this is a kind of funny story, again, and I told it to somebody recently, and I think she looked at me like I was mad, and she was a good person, so maybe I am mad. Um, but this is, again, just an example of how difficult and tricky things can be. So supporting Rachel out of the institution into her own home, the first few months, two months, everything was <coughs> absolutely fine. And then Rachel started to drink. And I don't just mean like just have an odd beer. She would go and get herself a bottle of sherry and drink it and immediately be doing wild and violent things. Now what, before Rachel was in the institution she'd had this similar pattern of behaviour. It'd been very dangerous. She'd been involved in prostitution and violence and she'd been hit in, in a car accident. She'd been drunk and hit. And, and had a brain injury. And in the institution, she didn't behave like that, and everybody assumed that she was now a different woman. But back in her own place, she, it seemed like that assumption was wrong. She wasn't a different woman, and this kind of stuff is stuff that she was kind of exploring again, put it that way. <coughs> so this was, this was like the first major crisis, actually, that my organisation had, and I I remember kind of the feeling of um, a panic in my soul, you know, just about, because we were getting people out in this kind of individual way and then to have somebody suddenly do all of this stuff and you think, oh my goodness. So we got everybody together that we could do, excluding Rachel. We didn't include Rachel in the conversation. We got Rachel's family, the social workers, the support team together. What are we going to do? And we filled a room like this, we filled it with flip chart paper analysing every single option that we could think of to stop Rachel going into this spiral around drink. Every single idea, every single enabling, creative idea that we could come up with. We were left with one idea that we haven't destroyed because it didn't look like it would You know, we'd put these nice ideas up and then we'd go down it and 
and, and, and then somebody goes, no, we've tried that before, or no, that won't work for this reason. So we were left with one idea, which was stop Rachel drinking. Tell her she can't drink. Take the drink off her. And so by logic, I was driven to saying, well, that's what we're going to have to do then, isn't it? So then it became my job as the director to drive off to Rachel's house and explain to her that this is what we we're going to do. And uh, she nodded, and yes. Uh, next day, I was called by one of the support staff. Rachel's gone and got herself, I think, was it a bottle of sherry or a bottle of wine? So I drove over again, and I, I said, right, well, explain this. And I, I, I took the wine and I poured it down the sink. All of this, you, you should probably be just thinking, he's a terrible person, why are we listening to him? The thing is, it did work. She never did it again. I did think, I and mean, this is like hypothesis, not proof, but one of the things is that what happened with her, her before in residential care was that nobody stopped her doing crazy stuff. And so it was almost like she kept pushing the boundaries all the time. Um, and I think we were the first people to say, no, we actually care about you. This is really bad for you. And we're not going to let you self-destruct. So I suppose that I'm saying freedom's complex, yeah?